Well, good morning. How many of you, by show of hands, have ever had a recurring dream? Oh, oh, good, I'm not alone. So I've had, there's this dream that I have had for like almost the past 20 years. And I dream that I'm in college. And some of you are like, well, you are dreaming. But it's about, I realize it's about halfway through my semester. I'm in college, it's halfway through the semester. And for some reason, I decide I'm gonna pull out my class schedule and take a look at what I've registered for. And it's in that moment that I realize there's a class on my schedule that I've registered for, that my parents have been paying for, and that I have not attended all semester. And, and so, of course, in my dream, I panic. And I run to the class, which in dream world is always taking place at that exact moment. And so as I'm running there, I decide, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to get there. I'm just going to throw myself at the mercy of the professor. Right? I'm just going to ask him, like, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. I don't know how I was signed up for this and didn't realize it. But is there any way I can make up the work that I've missed these last seven and a half weeks? And so um, I get there with that intention, and that never happens. Because as I walk in, there's always someone standing at the door, passing out like a big, thick packet of papers. And I look around, and the room is silent, and everyone is hunched over these papers at their desk taking a test. And so I, I feel the social pressure of doing what everyone else is doing. And so I take a seat, and I'm kind of hesitant about it. And I start to, to look through these questions about material that I've never been taught. And I realize in horror that I cannot answer a single question on the entire test. I'm not sure what happens after that. I don't know how this ends for me, because that's when I always wake up, and my heart's pounding, and I'm sweating, and I'm like, my parents are going to kill me. You, know, you have that moment where you're like, and then I'm like, oh, relief. It was just a dream. It didn't really happen. Hi, my name's Leah, and I struggle with a desire to have all of the right answers. Clearly, it manifests itself even in my subconscious. And if listening to that dream made you nervous or uncomfortable, you may struggle also. Um, being right has always been something that's been very important to me. But God is working on it. He's working on me. Um, marriage actually has been kind of an immersion therapy of sorts. You know what immersion therapy is? It's like when they take what you're afraid of and they immerse you in it. So like if you're afraid of snakes, they like throw you in a snake pit to cure you of your fear. So marriage has been like that for me and this struggle to always want to be right. God was like, oh, she likes to always be right. Give her a husband. I will fix it. And my husband is so sweet. He does not struggle with this as much as I do. Thank God, because I don't think both of us would survive. But he's more open to like learning new things and accepting perspectives that are different or challenge his own. He's more likely to admit when he doesn't know something or when he's wrong good thing. And um, I, on the other hand, am the kind of person that will fight to be right, even when I realize I'm not. You know what I mean? Like halfway through the argument, you're like, oh my gosh, wait, I think he's right. But I'm just going to keep going. Like I'm going to stick to my guns <laughs> because I don't want to be wrong. So maybe I can just convince him that I'm right. But I was talking to him about that this week, about this difference in our personalities. And I said, Chris, like, I know you're, you're more laid back about like, not always being right, but does it, do you still feel like the pressure to have the right answers? And he was like, well, yeah. Like when someone comes to me and they ask me a question, even though it's, I'm not like adamant about being right all the time like you are, like I still, I still want to be in the know. I want to have the answers. I want to avoid looking ignorant if it's possible. Sometimes it's not possible, but sometimes it is possible. And so we've been in this series in the book of Acts called Witness. And what we've been doing in this series is we're looking at the lives of the people who, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, but before he ascended into heaven, he said, he said this to them. He gave them these instructions. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my, what? witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And it was through these people who had witnessed a resurrected Jesus and in turn lived their lives as witnesses of that, that the good news of Jesus spread to the ends of the earth. And so over the last three weeks, we've looked at what it means for us to live as witnesses following their example, the way that they lived empowered by the Holy Spirit the way that they experienced authentic Christ-centered community with one another, 
the way that they live transformed lives because of Jesus. And as I think about living that way, I get anxious. Because inevitably, if we live differently, if we live like that, somewhere along the line, someone is going to start asking questions. 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared to give an answer. Does that make anybody else nervous? That makes me nervous. It was just this week, my eight-year-old daughter asked me a question about God and the Bible. It kind of stumped me a little bit, like I fumbled at first. Now, in my defense, it was late at night, and so I was tired, and nobody asks more profound questions than a child trying to delay bedtime, right? But she asked me this question, and I was like, oh man, I'm not, I'm not sure I know the right answer to this. And so I kind of fumbled a little bit and I explained it to her the best that I could. I, you know, it's hard with kids because you don't want to over explain, but you also don't want to, you know, give them less credit than they deserve and under explain. But to be honest, when I left her room, I had these, these feelings of inadequacy. So I was like, how am I supposed to live as a witness? How am I supposed to be prepared to give an answer to everyone when I can't even confidently answer the third grader that lives with me? But you know, it was in this moment of self-doubt that God reminded me um, that I can't tell my daughter what I don't know. There are gonna be questions that we get asked that we do not have the answers to, that we may not ever have the answers to this side of heaven. But he gently reminded me, you can tell her what you do know. And as we live as witnesses, while we may not have all of the answers to every biblical, spiritual, theological question that someone might ask us, each person in this room who has made the decision to follow Jesus has an effective tool for sharing your faith, for living as a witness, and it's your story. The stories of our experiences with Jesus the way that he's changed our lives, the things that we've learned about who he is as we've walked with him. So when it comes to living as witnesses in this quest to have all the right answers, I think sometimes we often overlook the importance of our stories. And stories are powerful, right? There's a reason that the global movie industry made over $41 billion in ticket sales last year because we will pay apparently a large amount of money to hear a good story. Stories are moving, they're inspiring, they're impactful. Jesus knew this, he was a master storyteller. He often in his teaching used parables to illustrate his points because he knew that stories appeal to people, that we can relate more readily to an account of someone's experience than we can to a list of of rules or facts or figures. And I think it's because we can find ourselves in a story. Even if the story isn't identical to our own, it's easy for us to kind of look at a story, to hear a story, and to put ourselves in the places where we do find commonality. And I don't know if you have noticed this, but it seems like recently there's kind of a shortage of good stories. <laughs> like when I watch the news, and when I scroll through social media, the good stories are kind of few and far between. Life is difficult and life is hard and life is heavy. And, and so when we share our stories, we have this opportunity to offer people who are lost and broken and hurting, to offer them an opportunity to step into a better story, to share with them the hope that we found in Jesus. One of the most effective ways to live as witnesses is simply by being ready and willing to share our stories, to tell people what Jesus means to us, what he's done in our lives. And maybe you're here this morning and you're like, that sounds great, except I don't have a story because I haven't, I haven't made the decision to follow Jesus. I don't have any personal experience with him. And if that's you this morning, I just wanna say like, I'm so glad that you're here. And I want to encourage you that whatever story you may be living in right now, like whatever story you've been living in up to this point, whether things are going great for you or life is difficult in this season, God wants nothing more than to invite you into a better story. There's more for you 
than what you've been settling for. And so with that in mind, let's go ahead and turn, if you're following along in your Bibles, to Acts 26. The scriptures will be up on the screens as well if it's easier for you to follow along that way. But in Acts chapter 26, we find Paul, and Josh introduced us to Paul last week. If you weren't here last week or if you're not familiar with Paul's story, um, Paul's original name was Saul. He's the artist formerly known as Saul. And Saul hated and persecuted anyone who was affiliated with Jesus until he had an encounter with God that completely transformed his life. And he changed his name to Paul and he began living his life as a witness of the transforming power of Christ, telling everyone he knew about the hope of Jesus. And so up to this point, Paul has gone on three missionary journeys. He's been attacked by the Jews, he's been arrested, he's been held in prison for over two years, and every time he gets the chance to speak, he still proclaims the message of Christ. And so when we pick up his story here in Acts 26, what we find is Paul giving his defense, he's a prisoner, and he's giving his defense before two Roman rulers. Now the first guy, his name is Festus, and Festus is the governor of Judea. The second guy is King Agrippa II, and he is the king over like a small northern part of Israel, and he has come to visit Festus in Judea. And so they've talked a little bit, and Festus actually told him about this guy, Paul, that they're holding prisoner. And as Agrippa kind of hears about Paul and the things he's been doing and the way that he lives, he says, I want to hear what this guy has to say. Like, I want to hear a little bit more about this guy's story. I'm curious. And so Festus has Paul brought before them, and King Agrippa invites him to speak. And so Paul gives kind of a brief introduction, and then he begins to share the story of what Jesus has done in his life. And I'm going to warn you, we're going to read his whole story together this morning, like in one large chunk. And it's a little bit more than we usually uh, read together in one section of scripture. But I want you to hang in there with me because I think it's so important for us to see how Paul delivers his story from beginning to end so that we can look practically about what we can learn from how he shares his story. So Acts 26, starting in verse 9. Paul says this, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. And I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. And on one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priests. And about noon, King Agrippa, I was on the road and I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. And we all fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats, which just means what you're doing right now is really only hurting you. And then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I've appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you've seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven first to those in Damascus, and then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. And that is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. This isn't new news. The Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and the Gentiles. Okay, now I know that was a lot of text. A bit more than we're used to reading together. 
But when you think in terms of sharing the story of how Jesus changed your life, it really wasn't that long. If you time it, Paul's story takes about three to four minutes to deliver. And so the first thing that we learn from Paul is when we share the stories of what Jesus has done in our lives, we need to be clear and concise. Paul doesn't share too much or too little. He shares just enough for there to be a clear understanding of what he's saying. And he's organized his information in a way that it makes sense to the people who are listening. He basically breaks his story down into three parts. If you notice, he talks first a little bit about what his life was like before he encountered Jesus. And then he shares what his encounter with Jesus was like. And then he tells what his life is like after Jesus has changed him. Now, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings or be mean this morning, but when you share your story, I want you to hear very clearly, nobody wants to hear every detail. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> that was more fun for some of you than others. I'm not sure what happened in the car on the way to church this morning, but it's showing. It's showing right now. Nobody wants to hear every detail. It's too much. And besides that, when we give too many details, we can actually end up just confusing people and distracting from our main point, which is to share Jesus with them. And so the first thing we learn from Paul is that when we share our stories, we need to be clear and concise. The second thing that we see is as Paul shares about his life at the beginning, like he jumps right in and he's talking about his life before he meets Jesus. And he shares some things that I'm sure are really difficult for him to share about himself. He looks at them and he's like, I persecuted people. I hunted them down. I was obsessed with persecuting them. I put them in prison. I was responsible for their death. This section of his story reads almost like a confession. And one of the things that we have to come to terms with as we prepare to share our stories about what Jesus has done in our lives with people is that we can't just share the good parts the highlight reel, the Instagram version of our stories. But we have to be prepared to share the not so pretty parts too. When we share our stories, we need to be vulnerable. We need to share our weaknesses, our mistakes, our shortcomings, even the times where we have totally blown it. And this can be really difficult for us, but it's so important. And here's why. Perfect people don't need a savior. And so if you're telling someone a story, but you leave out all the bad parts about yourself, and your point is to, to show them how much you need Jesus, then you've kind of missed the mark, right? Now don't hear what I'm not saying. Being overly specific Sharing like every gory detail about every bad thing you've ever done, every mistake you've ever made will do more harm than good. And so it's important as we share our stories to ask God for discernment as we decide, you know, not only who to trust with those ugly, not so fun parts of our story, but also what details and how much we should be sharing. But being willing to be vulnerable as we share our stories is crucial. And I want to be really clear here, too, that you don't have to have an extremely, like, sordid, ugly, seedy past like Paul did to have a powerful story. Like, sometimes we can get caught in this trap where we think, well, my, my, my story is kind of boring. Like, I don't really have anything exciting to share. Maybe you, you're here and you became a Christian at a young age, and so you're, you know, before Jesus portion of your story is like one sentence. And if that's you, the truth is you can share parts of your life that you surrendered to Christ long after you made the decision to initially follow him. The things that God has continued to refine in you as you've grown in relationship with him. Because one of the most wonderful and probably equally difficult things about following Jesus is that our story is ongoing, isn't it? We don't just make a decision to follow him and then everything's perfect. It's a process. Paul puts it this way in Philippians. He says, 
Be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Following Jesus isn't like a one and done deal. That'd be easier, wouldn't it? I remember a few years ago, I was wrestling through a season in my life where the Holy Spirit just kept revealing all of these like ugly parts of myself, like things I hadn't surrendered to God. And it was really painful to realize these things and to give them over one by one. And it just felt like it was one thing after another. And I, I remember telling my husband one night, like, I'm so tired. <laughs> how long is God going to keep doing this in me? Like, how long is he going to keep showing me these things? And he looked at me, and I felt like his question was totally unrelated to what we were talking about. He looked at me, and he said, how long do you plan on following Jesus? And I was like, my whole life, what's that have to do with anything? And he was like, well, that, that's how long then. Like, that's how long he's going to continue to refine you. That's how long he's going to continue to ask you to surrender things over to them, to him. We need to be vulnerable as we share what God has done and continues to do in our lives. The third thing that I notice about Paul is that even though Paul is telling his story, he knew it wasn't about him. See, he has the opportunity here. Remember, he's, he's a prisoner. He's been a prisoner for two years, and he has the opportunity to plead his case before two royal officials. And instead of giving them a defense focused on himself, what we hear is a testimony focused on Christ. And so we learn from Paul that it's important as we share our stories to be humble. I once heard somebody at, a, at an academic banquet give a speech to honor a former teacher. It was a student that had had this teacher. And the student began, he started by acknowledging the giftedness of his teacher, but then he kind of launched into this monologue about all of his own accomplishments. And I think his point was to give credit for those accomplishments to the teacher. But unfortunately, that wasn't real clear. And so it just felt like this really weird, icky, awkward conversation about how awesome he was. <laughs> and I think that's a danger when we share our stories, that we're the hero in our own story. But Paul knew that he wasn't the hero in his story. And as we share our stories, we need to remember that we aren't the point. We're not sharing our stories to let everyone know how awesome we are. We share our stories to highlight the love of God, the saving grace that's available to each one of us because of the cross and the freedom that can be found in a relationship with Christ. And so when you walk away from sharing your story, you don't want to leave the person thinking about you. You want to leave them thinking about him. The fourth thing we see is that Paul was ready he was ready to share his story, and we need to be ready as well. King Agrippa heard about Paul, who he was, how he lived, and it piqued his curiosity. And he wanted to know his story, and so he asked him to share it, and Paul was ready to do that. And the same thing might happen to you. As people notice that you live differently, that you spend your money differently, that you treat your kids differently, that you talk to your wife differently, that you have this weird hope and peace and joy when it doesn't make sense. And when they notice those things, they might ask you, why? And in that moment, we need to be ready. Whether it comes up naturally in conversation or whether you sense the Holy Spirit telling you, hey, it's time to share this part of your story with this person, you and I need to be ready to share our stories. We need to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have. Now, I would love to stop there and just tie it all up in a neat little bow, but I can't ignore the end of this story in Acts 26, this encounter that Paul has. Because after Paul has shared his story, and he's done such a great job, he's clear and concise, he's vulnerable, he's, he does it with humility, and he was ready to share. We can't ignore the response of these two men. And here's how they respond. Festus interrupts Paul and says, you are out of your mind, Paul. 
Your great learning is driving you insane. Essentially, you're a crazy person. King Agrippa, his response is a little more tempered, but it's not much better. He says, Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? <laughs> not exactly the response I was hoping for as I'm preaching this. And I'm sure Paul was probably disappointed when that was their response. But look at how he replies in verse 29. King Agrippa says, do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul says, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am. When we share our stories with people, we need to remember this. Their response is not our responsibility. When the response of these two men to Paul laying everything out there, sharing the ugly details and then what God had done in his life, when their response was negative, when it was less than ideal, he, isn't, he doesn't get upset. He's not embarrassed. He doesn't get defensive. He doesn't try to persuade them or convince them because Paul knows that only God can change a life. Paul was obedient in sharing his story, but he leaves the work of transforming lives squarely on the shoulders where it belongs. He leaves it up to God. And the truth is, as fun as it would be to think that every time we share our story, someone's going to be like, oh my gosh, you're right, I've been missing it this whole time, and they're going to get on their knees and accept Jesus. The truth is that may not happen. You may share your story and see no significant change right away. You may share your story and not see any change at all. You might have somebody look in the, you in the face and tell you, you're crazy. You're insane. You've lost your mind. And if that happens, I need you to hear this morning, it's okay. We can respond just like Paul did. He's like, hey, that's okay. But what I've said is true. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to keep praying for you. I'm just going to pray that God will work in your heart. And that someday you'll believe it and that you'll experience these things that I've talked about for yourself. We need to remember as we share our stories that we can live as witnesses, but there is only one Savior. That's not us. There are two groups of people in this room today. And so I just want to close our time together by asking each group just one question. Maybe you're in the group of people here this morning and you are like Paul. At some point in your life, you made the decision to follow Jesus. It doesn't matter if it's been 30 days or 30 years. It doesn't matter if you have a crazy transformation story or if your story with Jesus is a little more conservative. My question for you this morning is this, who could benefit from hearing your story? The story of how you finally stopped running and you gave your life to Jesus. The story about what God has done in your marriage. The story about how God has healed you in places of addiction. The story about how God has healed your physical body. The story about how he's changed the way you manage your finances or parent your children. Who in your life would the story of what God has done be good news to? Who do you know right now that you could offer the opportunity to step into a better story than they have been settling for simply by sharing your own story? So maybe you're here this morning and that's not you. Maybe you're in the second group of people. You haven't made the decision to follow Jesus. If I, if I asked you to find yourself in this story in Acts 26, you would identify more with King Agrippa than Paul. You have questions. You're skeptical, but you're curious. You're uncertain, but you being here tells me that you're at least intrigued. My question for you this morning is this. Who could you ask to share their story with you? About who could you say, you know, if I knew their story, 
Like if I just sat down and listened to them, some of my questions might get answered. If I just had the courage to ask and the patience to listen, then maybe my understanding of what it means to, to follow Jesus, to have a relationship with God, would grow. Maybe it's a person that you came here with today, someone who invited you to church. Maybe it's somebody that's not in this room, but as you think about this question, there's somebody that you know who's following Jesus and they live in such a way that leaves you kind of scratching your head most of the time because they're doing things differently, but it seems to be working for them. They're living a story that's working better than the story that you are living out right now. Who could benefit from hearing your story? Or who could you ask to share their story with you? Because shared stories, that's how the gospel spread. It's how the good news of Jesus spread. People living as witnesses of a resurrected Jesus. We are each sitting in this room today because there are people who over 2,000 years ago encountered Jesus and told somebody about it. And I can't help but reflect on how my own life has been changed because of someone like that. Both of my parents were raised in church, um, but neither of them had any real idea about what it meant to have a relationship with God or, or to, to follow Jesus with their lives. And when they were newly married, they moved away from their families in Canton, Ohio to Dayton, Ohio, next door to a woman named Patty Scholl. And Mrs. Scholl lived as a witness. And she did with my parents all of the things that we've talked about so far in this series. She, she invited them to dinner. She invested in relationship with them. And she shared the story of how Jesus had changed her life with her words and the way that she lived. And my parents noticed. And they asked questions. And they listened. And as a result, our family, my mom, my dad, my brother, and my little sister, have experienced the transforming power of Jesus in our lives. And my siblings and I have shared that with our spouses. It's my brother and his wife, Sarah, my husband, Chris and I, and my little sister, Angela, and her husband, Mark. And the six of us have committed to raising our 10 children in Christ-centered homes. And so each of the people that you see in these pictures have lives that were changed because one woman was brave enough to share what Jesus had done in her life with the young couple next door. But don't miss this. My parents were brave enough to listen, to consider that maybe God had something more for them something more for their family than the story that they had been settling for up to that point. And I'm standing up here this morning just filled with gratitude for the courage of Mrs. Scholl and the courage of my mom and dad. And I can't help but wonder what might change if each person in this room left here today with that same courage. Courage to tell our own stories. Courage to listen to someone else's story. Courage to ask questions. How many people would experience a better story, would get to experience the transforming love of God if we lived like that? Who might be sitting in a room 100 or 200 or 2,000 years from now who otherwise might not be there? because we were bold enough to tell or brave enough to listen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to be together this morning and to hear from your word. And Lord, I thank you for the life of Paul. I thank you for the transformation in his life. And I also thank you for the boldness that he had to share his story. I thank you for all of the witnesses who have gone before us, who have attested to the transforming power of your grace and your love.
God, I just pray this morning that you would give us courage. It's not easy to be different. It's not easy to share with people things that they might look at us and say, you're nuts. And so we need a supernatural strength as we share our stories that can only come from you. And so we just ask that you give us that, that you provide exactly what we need, the exact measure of courage that we need to step out and to bravely share our stories. And Father, I thank you for the people in this room who up to this point don't have a story with you, Lord, and I pray for courage for them as well. I pray that you'll give them courage when it's easier probably to just continue on doing what they've always done, living how they've always lived. I pray that you'll give them the courage to consider that you've got a better story that's waiting for them and that they would ask questions, that they would keep seeking you. And we thank you so much that you invite us into a bigger and better story than we could ever imagine. Lord, give us the courage to take hold of it. Amen.